Well, good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in to our Relevant Word uh, broadcast. You know, I'm wearing this hat that I wore on this Sunday exactly one year ago. You remember as we were ushered into the valley of the virus, I came out on the very first Sunday that our church was shut down and I had this hat on. As you can read, it says abide. As the country was ushered into this virus and people were afraid, not knowing what was going to happen, my wife and I and my family had just gotten off of a cruise. And I had, remember getting on an airplane back to Indianapolis. We had to try to get home quickly before they shut down the airports. And I got on the plane and I'm walking to my seat and the airline stewardess said to me, thank you for wearing that hat. That is exactly what we need to do in all of this uncertainty, and that is to abide. If you remember right, it was little Zora Edmonds that wrote me later and remembered my sermon, abide, period. So I thought I would start our one-year anniversary reminding you of how far the Lord has brought us. We have been abiding for 12 months now, and God has kept us. So God bless you. We're glad you've tuned in. We hope that you will enjoy our message today. And so let's get ready to go to the Word of God. And why? And so while we're getting ready to turn to our text today, I want to remind everybody that we are in the midst of a fast. And so we hope you would join us. Uh, we know that uh, for the next 21 days, uh, I'm asking everybody to fast, that God will uh, do three things. Number one, bless this ministry. Number two, that he would help our country uh, in this polarization that we are experiencing and that somehow the church will be a part of the remedy. And then number three, that God will bless our country, and uh, continue to bless our community. So those are the things we're praying for, and we hope you will join us. We're going to turn now to back to the text that we started on last Sunday, John's chapter 9, John chapter 9. We're going to start at verse 1 again, and we're going to read uh, this familiar story that we started to dine on on last Sunday. And as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Look at that we. We must do the works of him that sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went, washed, and came home seeing. Today's message is a continuation of last Sunday's message, the Master's touch. Jesus is walking through the streets of Jerusalem with his disciples on a beautiful day. Uh, birds are singing, people are hustling about the busy Jerusalem streets, and he encounters on this day a blind man. Now, Jesus encountering blind and deaf people was par for the course. It was not unusual 
However, this encounter was not like all the rest. You see, this man was born blind. This is the only time in Scripture, at least recorded in the Gospels, where Jesus healed a man born blind. I mean, how do you make eyes see that I've never seen? How do you do that? I mean, that's how magnificent God is. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but this sermon is just for you because you feel as if you're in an impossible situation. But here in the text, how do you make eyes that have never seen see? Well, the answer to this question is definitely, is definitely not a scientific one, right? The only answer to this sightless condition is a miracle. This man is in need of the master's touch. I began this conversation on last week by sharing that I have studied miracles and I have been a part of them in my own life experiences. And, and, and I've come to the conclusion, I've discovered that most miracles, not all, but most miracles manifest themselves in five phases. I call it uh, my, uh, my study of miracleology. Five phases. And as we can see, these phases are played out in the realm and the miracle of this blind man in our text. John 9 and 2 said, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And we looked at that and we begin to realize that the first phase of every miracle is what we call the tribulation phase. And now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining the tribulation phase. Uh, uh, you're going to have to go and listen to part one of the Master's Touch that I preached on the first Sunday in this month of March. But the tribulation phase, Lord, who sinned that this man was born blind? Did his parents mess up or, or, or did he do something? The tribulation phase is the problem or the suffering period of your life. It's usually the result of something physical, something sometimes psychological, sometimes it's, uh, it could be a spiritual challenge, but it's a challenge that's way too big for you, and it just showed up on your doorstep. It's often a very stressful and sometimes painful experience, and somebody listening to me right now, is you're in a tribulation period of, 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 of your situation. I mean, it's very difficult, and I'm so glad you tuned in today because God wants to speak to you in your storm. In essence, you are a candidate for a miracle. Then the second phase that we shared with you on last Sunday, again, I want you to listen to that sermon if you didn't, if you missed it, and that was the cognition phase, right? We determined that tribulation comes out of nowhere, cancer can come out of nowhere, a bad accident could happen at any moment, comes out of nowhere, storms come into our lives that we did not anticipate or expect. These things happen, no warning at all, but here they are, boom, we're ushered into the tribulation period. However, the second phase of, of, of my study of miracleology is this cognition phase, and, and this is the phase where you do at some point in, the, in, in, in that tribulation where you have a, a choice to make. Uh, you, 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 you have a decision to make. This is where the rubber hits the road, and I believe as I study all five of these phases that this is probably the most important phase. And that phase is you've got to decide, are you going to go at this problem alone, or are you going to turn it over to a higher power? 
Are you going to turn over your diagnosis? Are you going to turn over your struggle? Are you going to turn over that, whatever that dilemma might be, over to the higher power? The tribulation phase is, is the why me, Lord? Why now? This is too hard for me, Lord. The cognition phase, I'm struggling. What shall I do? I have to decide, am I going to go at this thing alone or am I going to trust he that is omniscient, he that is omnipotent, he that is omnipresent? Omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, and omnipresent everywhere, all at the same time. Yes, while he's working on somebody's tribulation over in Russia or in Africa, or in New York, or down in Florida, guess what? He's also working on your tribulation because he's omnipresent. And that is why I left the story on last week on those first two phases of miracleology. The blind man has endured a lifetime of tribulation, and Jesus has come down his street. Praise God. Jesus has come down his street, and now he has to make a cognitive decision. John 9 and 5 says this, as long as I'm in the world, Jesus is talking here, I am the light of the world. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And so here this man, born in darkness, hears these words, and now he's ushered into what I call the third phase, and that is the positional phase. The positional phase. In verse 6 of this chapter, having said this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Look at that. He spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. You see, so many people miss their miracle. They miss their breakthrough because they are out of position. They, they miss that next promotion. They, they miss that next right relationship. They, they, they miss that next victory because they are out of of position when it comes to God. You see, my brothers and my sisters, my sons and my daughters, you can't expect a miracle from God if you're not in relationship with God, if you are out of position. The positional phase is, is also a critical phase. You've got to get in a position. Have, have you ever watched football or, or basketball or even soccer or some of these other sports? Every now and then, the coach will call a timeout. Well, why is the coach calling a timeout? Well, he's calling a timeout because either someone is out of position and the other team is scoring, or he wants to reposition his team so that they can score or so that they can defend. He's trying to get them in position or she is trying to get them in position. That is the same way it is in the game of life. If you're out of position, you will not win. You will not win if you are out of position. And you need a coach called the Holy Ghost that will call a timeout, get you to the sidelines of life, and minister to you and remind you that you need to get in position. Sometimes that coach is your pastor as he preaches on Sunday morning. Sometimes it's your enrichment teacher as he or she teaches during Sundays. Sometimes it's your youth leader, but, but, but they're put in your life to help you to realize that if you want to be blessed, if you want to be a candidate for a miracle, you've got to get in position. You have to be in relationship with God. You see, your position determines your provision. 
Oh, somebody need to put that out there for me. Text it, do tweet it, do something with it. I'm going to say it again. Your position determines your provision. If you really want to spice it up, you can say it this way. Your, pro, po, your position in God will determine your provision from God. You have to get and stay in position. Now, positioning does require faith and action. Paul said that that. That, 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 that the, 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 our walk requires faith and action. Faith without works is what? That's right, dead. And works without faith is what? That's right, dead. They go together. So you have to, you're getting in position means that you are walking by faith. The man knew that Jesus was somebody special and that he may never, ever come his way again. And so he decided that he needed to get in position. This is an amazing text. The Bible says, having said this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. What? What? All of a sudden... The man hears somebody spit. Now, this blind man, according to verse 8, was a professional beggar. You go down to te- look at verse 8, you know that he was a professional beggar. That's what blind men did in those days. They couldn't hold down a job, and so they depended on others to give them alms. He could not take care of himself. Matter of fact, the Bible seems to suggest that this man is living still with mom and them. He's still living with his parents. So he suffered many insults in life. However, he hears somebody spit. Now, he he can't see, but he can hear very well. My brothers and my sisters, I, I, I just want to be very transparent here. You know, I can take about anything but somebody spitting on me or near me. I think the only fight I ever got in, I got in one fight in my whole life in school, and that was because the school bully spit on me. And I tell you how bad I feel about being spit upon is that I took on the school bully. I, I lost my mind. No, he did not spit on me. No, he did not do that. And, and I got in this big fight with the bully, and, uh, and, and I, I'll, I'll tell you that I came out on top. Uh, people still wondering, how did you beat that, 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 that bully up? And I, it was nothing, but I, I was so angry and so upset. How dare he spit on me? The Bible says here that Jesus spits on the ground, makes a mud pie, places the spit and the mud combination on the man's eyes. <laughs> Come on, y'all. I know we're in church, and I know we're holy, and I know that, you know, but, but can I just be honest with you? I, I believe that for some of us, and I'll say us, we would have lost our opportunity for a miracle right then and there. We would have forfeited our miracle. We, we, would have, we would have gotten out of position. No, no, he didn't. Oh, heck no. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning it up. No, no, he did not spit. And then had the audacity to put spit and mud in my eyes. Wait a minute, Jesus. I'm already blind. And you're going to put spit and mud on my face, in my eyes. We would have lost it. But remember, (laughs) this is the faith phase. You can't operate in the natural if you're going to stay in position. You can't. You got to rely on the supernatural. You got to, listen, you've got to be still when it looks like God's not moving as fast as you want him to move, when it seems like God's not doing the way you want God to do it. But if you're going to get to that next level, In this miracle, you've got to stay in position no matter what's going on around you. 
Wow. Now, the funny thing about this use of spit is not the first time Jesus spit on anyone or put spit on anyone. Let me show you a couple of scriptures. Here they are. Look at it with me in Mark chapter 7. Look at what it says, verse 33. Now, after he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Look at that. Then he what? He what? He spit and touched the man's tongue. What? He spit and touched the man's tongue. Then he looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, Epitha, Epitha, which means be opened. And at this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. <laughs> the Bible said that Jesus spit and put the spit not on his ears, put it on his tongue. He stuck his finger in the man's mouth and said, be opened. Wait a minute. Another version. Look at it with me in Mark 8 and 22. They came to Bethsaida, the Bible says, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Then they told Jesus to do what? To touch him. What did Jesus do in verse 23? He took the blind man by the hand, led him outside of the village, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus says, do you now see anything? <laughs> oh, I, he spit in his eyes. And then asked the man, do you see <laughs> Do you see anything? Come on, Jesus. Look at this thing. Jesus and spit have a strange marriage in Scripture. One of the most controversial things you can do to anyone is to put spit on them. Yet Jesus uses it, uses it over and over. This methodology, he, he, he's reoccurring with him. Could it be that Jesus is using that which, which, uh, which uh, how should I say it, that causes us to be repulsive? Could it be that he's using it to see if we're really going to stay in position? I mean, here he literally spit in the man's eyes. I believe he's testing this man's, here it is, positional faith, his positional faith. Remember a few weeks ago when I preached from the sermon, Who Let the Dogs In? And there was a, a, a black sister who had come to see Jesus, and, and he literally insinuated, he even called her a dog. But like that woman back in the Gospel of Matthew the blind man, even though he got spit all in his eyes and mud in his eyes, he kept his cool. Like that sister. She kept her cool. She stayed in position. This man stayed in position because we can't think in the natural when it comes to God. We have to start thinking in the supernatural. Wow. Spit and all. He stayed in position. Then Jesus said, go. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. For this word means sent. This word pool means, or Siloam means sent. So after anointing the man's eyes with that spittle mud clay, Jesus gives him a command. Go. Wash in the pool of Siloam. And we, we see in the Bible it means sent. So the blind man, watch this, I love this. The blind man was sent to the pool called sent by he that had been sent by God. Can I say that again? This revelation came to me as I began. Look at this. The blind man was sent to the pool called sent by he that was sent by God the Father. So here he is. 
The disciples are looking at him. Jesus is watching him. This man is now stumbling toward the pool of Siloam. Spit and dirt dripping from his face. In other words, he stayed in position. He's walking by faith and not by sight. You know, to think about this text, we don't know how far the pool of Siloam was. Remember, this is a blind man. We don't know if the pool of Siloam was down the street or if it was across town. It didn't matter to the man. He, he wanted to make sure that he had positional faith activated, and he's going to the pool of Siloam. And no doubt he'd been to the pool before. How else would he know where it was? I mean, he probably sat there a hundred times resting between his begging episodes. But nothing ever happened there. But this time, Jesus tells him to go to the pool of Siloam. Now, now he's stumbling toward the pool, and, 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 and he's trying to get there. You see, sometimes God has to irritate us before he can liberate us. See, we get mad at irritation in life, but sometimes God is really setting us up for a liberation moment. Can you imagine walking? You're already blind. Now you got mud and, and in your eyes, and, you know, if you get just a little speck of dirt in your eyes, you're going to be rubbing it. So he's rubbing his eyes. He's trying to get to the pool of Siloam. He's walking by faith and not by sight. And you can imagine people laughing at him, you know, people talking and gossiping. They're whispering. Look at him. You know, did you see what happened? To that, that, that Jesus guy put mud in his eyes. And, and, and look, look at him. Look at him. Where's he going? Oh, he told him to go to the pool of Siloam. Oh, he's going down there. Oh, my God. He's got to go and wash his face. Oh, but this brother stayed in position. And I know he's thinking to himself, I know this ain't pretty, but the light of the world. That fellow named Jesus told me to go and wash. I've tried everything else. I'm going to do what he said. I'm going to stay in position. I've been in tribulation too long. I'm making a cognitive decision. I'm in, in my own mind. It doesn't seem, it don't, I know it don't make sense, but I'm going to make a cognitive decision, and I'm going to get in position, and I'm going to do what he said do. I know it doesn't look good. It looks like it may never come to fruition, but I'm going to go to the pool and wash. See, now his Cognition is working with his position. He's thinking right, and he's walking in the right direction. Now think about it, my brothers and my sisters, my sons and my daughters. Jesus could have healed that blind man on the spot right then and there. There was no healing power in the, in the pool of Siloam. There was nothing magical there. As I said earlier, this man had been there a hundred times. There was no power in the pool of Siloam. The power came as a result of this man's obedience by walking in faith. Look at what happened. Verse 7 says, so the man went. Look at that. He went. He didn't argue with God. He didn't argue with Jesus. He didn't, he didn't keep in that why me phase. The Bible says he went and he what? He washed and he came home seeing. Can I say that again? Verse 7. He went and he washed and he came home seeing. Now, when I read that, it, it, is, it is so as I would say, melodramatic. So he went, he washed, and he came home seeing. 
Come on, Judd. Surely that's not what happened. That's so melodramatic. He, he went, he washed, and he came home saying, no, that it can't be that way. That this man has never, ever seen anything before. He didn't even know how to get home by his sight. And, and you're going to just say he went, he washed, and he came home saying, no, John, something else had to happen. Why didn't you write it down? Surely this man, once his eyes were open, he started screaming, yes, I can see. I can see. Surely he started running around and touching people and saying, look, look at me. I can see. But John says, well, he went, he washed, and he went home seeing. No, come on, John. He, he just couldn't have just got up and just went home like nothing happened. Surely he took some flips and he he began to hug people and began to scream at the top of his lungs, and I can see, I can see. I, God, gets, God gets so upset at us when he does the miraculous in our lives, and all we do is be quiet about it. No, don't waste your miracle. Use it. Oh. So now he went, he washed, he went home seeing. That, that ushers him into what I call the liberation phase. The liberation phase. The liberation phase is the phase where tribulation is done. It is ended. You're no longer, you're cancer-free. Right? Your, your storm has ceased. Your body is healed. The tribulation phase is over. The man left home blind, but the Bible said he returned home seeing. Praise God. Ah. Uh. This is such a, uh, a dramatic turnaround that, 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 that his neighbors took notice. Look at verse 8 with me. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some said, No, that ain't him. That ain't him. I, that, that ain't him. That cannot be him. And then I love this last part. I just wish I could just take off and run around the church with some of y'all right now. But he said, look what he says. I am the man. <laughs> I love that. I am the man. I am the one. I'm he. I'm the one that was once blind, but now I see. I, I am the man. I am the man. Can I just take a picture of this right now? My God, this man left home one way, he comes back another, and it is so uh, mind-boggling and mind-blowing and so miraculous that his own neighbors refused to accept the fact that it was him. And watch this, they even augured with him. I can hear one of his neighbors saying, no, you ain't him. I've been living in this neighborhood for 40 years, and you all, you, you, you can't be that guy because that guy's always been blind. He, he, he was born blind. I know his mom and them. He said, no, man, I am him. It's something about when God gets hold of your life and he begins to change those things that used to hold you down. Maybe you do have a different look. Maybe you have a different glow. He said, guys, I am the fellow. I am him. That is such a blessing. That, that just, oh, my God, that just wants me to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. Amen. He's thinking in his mind of all the sick people in the world uh, and all the blind people in the world, I am the one that now see. Jesus came into my little world and healed my big problem. 
of all the people, he came into my little world and healed my big problem. I love the hymn that said, shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I'm no longer the same. Praise God. I, I, I'm not going to sing the rest of this. I'm going to sing the rest of it a little later. But, 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 but that's, can I just stop right there? I, then the hands of Jesus touched me, and now I'm no longer the same. Y'all don't even recognize me now that I've been with Jesus. The once blind man is now enjoying the liberation phase. However... Not everybody's happy. Everybody's not going to dance at your breakthrough. Everybody's not going to be happy about your miracle. Some folks are not going to be happy about your promotion or your blessing. That's just the way life is. The Bible said here in verse 24, everybody is not happy. Look at it with me, verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind, and they said this. They hear the Pharisees and all those folks. And Now, come on now. Give glory to God by telling the truth, man. Come on. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He replied, well, <laughs> whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. All I know, one thing I do know, come on, somebody. I was blind, but now I see. <laughs> I don't care if you don't want to celebrate with me. I don't care if you don't want to sing with me. I just want you to know that I once was blind, but now I see. Y'all can call him whatever you want to call him. All I know is that he changed my life. You're going to always have player haters that will always be in your life. Hater players, player haters, you know what I'm talking about. You're going to always have that group of people that they're not going to celebrate with you when you get your breakthrough. But he said, I don't care what y'all want to say about this man. All I know, he changed my world, and now I can see. Hey Amen. The Bible said they got so mad. Watch this. They kicked him out of the temple. They kicked him out of the synagogue. Y'all, they threw the man out of church. They could not accept his testimony. In verse 35, the Bible said that Jesus heard that they had thrown him out of the church. And when he found him, he said, Sir, do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Son of Man? You see, this man has been healed physically, but he does not have total liberation yet. Not only does he need physical healing, but he also needs spiritual healing. Jesus finds this man sitting on the doorstep of the church with his head down because he had been expelled and Jesus, the very foundation of this church, the headstone that was rejected, said to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? You see, true liberation comes after spiritual revelation. And I want to say this to you. you you've had... You, you've had miracles take place in your life. You, you've had, some of you have had your finances restored. Some of you have gotten jobs that you didn't really uh, deserve. I mean, you've had some liberating stuff happen in your, in your life. But all of that stuff is tangible. It's not eternal. Now Jesus is meeting his spiritual and his eternal needs. And that ushers into this last phase as I close out today. And that is the celebration phase. Look at it with me. Verse 38. Then the man said, Lord, I believe in the Son of Man. And he worshiped him. 
Don't you realize that, that you don't have to be in church to have church? You don't have to be in the pew to praise God. <laughs> the Bible said that though he had been thrown out of the church, he now has his own church in front of he that should be the center of our worship. The Bible said he began to worship him. O-M-G. Our magnificent God. He worshiped him. He had church on the spot. The greatest response to God's miracle is the celebration that must take place so that others can know that you have been blessed and rescued by the goodness of the Lord. Can I finish my song now? Amen. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me, and he made me whole. Since I met the blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, I would never cease to praise him. I'll shout it till eternity rolls. Oh, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And all the joy that floods my soul, something happened, and now I know he touched me. And now I've been made whole. Praise God. From tribulation to cognition, get in position. Here comes your liberation, and you need to let some other folk know that you're in celebration for what God has done in your life. Those are the five steps of miracleology. Some of us get to that liberation step, and we, we are stalled. Don't do that to God. Don't let him bless you and you not celebrate his blessings in front of others. I hope you've been blessed by this message today. The master's touch is available to you right now. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for reminding us that you're still in the miracle business. And somebody listening to this sermon right now, the doctors have said we can't do no more. The relationship looks dead. The circumstances look bleak. Darkness has permeated this person's life. But oh God, you are the light of the world. And though it may not seem in the natural, we're going to come through this, but you have a supernatural touch that can make all things well. Father, I want to pray for that man. I want to pray for that young woman right now that's listening to me that needs a touch from you. Only you, God, can handle some circumstances. And we're going to have this cognition moment and we're going to put it right now we're going to decide right here and there right here and now to put this thing in your hands and we're going to leave it and whatever you decide to do is going to be liberating for us in your name we pray amen 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 well thank you again for tuning in to our relevant word broadcast if you want to accept Christ as your personal Savior, if, if you want to be in position, then I want you to right now put in the chat your email or if you don't mind sharing your cell phone number. We'll keep it very confidential and we will contact you 
about your next step in the miracle of salvation process. But we love you and we thank God for you. Remember what I've taught you. I'm going to say it every week. Do not throw away your shot. Go and get vaccinated so that we can be with you again in person real soon. See you next time. See you next week. Remember, nothing is too hard for God. Let's abide. Well, we're out of time and want to say thank you again for listening to the Relevant Word live stream broadcast of the New Era Church. If you enjoyed the message today, simply log in to nne.org and leave an email or text us at 317-662-0329. We appreciate you and all the support you give to keep this ministry airing. So please send all tithes, offerings, and donations online at nne.org or simply text and EC give to 77977. You can also mail or use our church drop box at 517 West 30th Street, Indianapolis, Indiana. Until the next time, remember, God loves you.